Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I am here at Slick 2, SLC 2, in Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. And I'm standing right next to Firefly's Alpha rocket. We're just a few days away from their second orbital launch attempt with their Alpha rocket, and this is for the mission to the Black. Now, I had the pleasure of speaking with a handful of experts about this rocket and what's changed from the first one, the mission, and all sorts of other really cool stuff. So let's hear what they have to say. We're gonna go up there. Megan, nice to meet you, I'm nice Tim. Nice to meet you. Awesome, so tell me what you do at Firefly. Um, so I'm the senior manager of launch and test operations, but for Sunday, I will be the launch conductor for flight two. Nice. I was the launch conductor for flight one, so really excited to come back and do it again. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're at the formidable end of something that's gonna be uh, taking off here in just under two days the right now. The flamey end, The right? flamey end, exactly. Well, I'm a little confused right now, because flamey end sideways. It's well, not down, uh, which we, we did have to verify for you last Is that time. gonna be on, do you know we're gonna do that on the comms net again? We, I mean, we can. That was, I know that's like the <laughs> silliest thing, but that was one of my favorite things that's yeah, ever happened. Are there any big hardware changes that you guys had to make in between flight one and two? So uh, I think a lot of the changes that happened out here in Vandenberg were particularly related to the pad. And the GSE guys have done a tremendous amount of work, both getting the pad commissioned again and implementing changes. So a big one came into our GN2 farm. We changed LN2 into GN2 at the site for use on the vehicle. Uh, that was actually something that would have scrubbed us on flight one um, on one of our attempts. Mm -hmm. And so they've done a bunch of work to improve that system. Would that well. have been a, a commodity you would have had to replenish before? And so now we actually couldn't or? consume it. We we consumed it at such a rate that we were drawing down our resources. And so the, okay. the rate at which we changed LN2 to GN2 was not fast enough to keep up with the consumption rate of okay. the rocket. So they made some changes in that system in order to improve um, our access, our availability, and how much we actually consume during the day. That was great. We made some changes to our TVC bleed system to make us able to bleed in earlier in the day mm -hmm. um, and a whole bunch of other changes I'm probably blanking right now. <laughs> well, but, but, and my understanding though is in general, the rocket itself hasn't actually changed that much. Not There's tremendously. Maybe just a few little parts here and there, but like the, the design itself is, is relatively similar. the same. Pretty which similar. is a testament that the first go was, was a, a great design and it just needed a little bit of a just a little spattering. I of... mean, it certainly makes ops easier that you don't have to accommodate for a whole bunch of differences, yeah. um, but not a not a ton of stuff. Yeah. Um, for Sunday's launch attempt, though, uh, what are you what are you hoping? What's going to be your big like sigh of relief for you? What, you oh, know? man, I have a, I have a mission. I have a personal mission that I have as the LC hit the first minute of the first window of every attempt we've ever made. We didn't go every time we had right. to recycle, but I have, as the LC, hit the first minute of every window we've ever had at Vandenberg. Wow. And I will do that on Sunday. Well, we're all really excited uh, for, this, for this launch attempt. I mean, we've been waiting and it's it's looking good. It's feeling good. I know. I've got a good feeling about it. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll all be cheering for you. Thanks so much for your Thank time. You, really sir. appreciate it. Good luck Sunday. Appreciate yeah. it. Shay, great meeting you. Nice meeting you. Uh, so first up, tell everyone what you do here at Firefly. So I run the spacecraft division right now, which includes the lunar lander and our OTV spacecraft product lines. I started uh, about four and a half years ago, and this is also my baby. I did three years on Alpha before I switched over to spacecraft. Wow, so you know this vehicle inside now. I, I knew it inside and out. 18 months is, uh, you, you forget a lot, but <laughs> yeah, I still know it pretty well. And well, I'm still very passionate about it, so. Well, cause you have worked on a, a just wide array of vehicles. Give me a like, quick little like checklist of some of the some of the projects you've worked on in the past. So, started out late 90s on uh, on Iridium, original Iridium, and the Teledesic, it got canceled. Um, I worked on Sibbers Low for a couple years. That was an that was a uh, infrared space um, constellation for early warning detection of uh, ballistic missiles. Uh, got a chance to work at NASA for four years at Kennedy. Uh, worked on almost every launch they did that was unmanned. So uh, Mars missions, worked early uh, Pluto, work on the Pluto mission. Oh, wow. So just a ton of fun stuff. Access to all the vehicle sites, the, the whole LSP team there, uh, launch services program. Uh, but then went into spacecraft. I wanted to actually get back in a clean room and build spacecraft. So I did that for a year. Uh, we launched out out of Wallops on a Minotaur, and then I went to Orbital Sciences for six years. That's where I got in with uh, Taurus II, which is now Antares. Yep. Then I started getting bored with um, kind of traditional aerospace, and the SpaceX, you know, was in, that was 2012, SpaceX was in full force, and I had the opportunity to leave and consult for some friends. Uh, the, the Iridium Next team was launching on SpaceX. Yep. Uh, some of my NASA friends were certifying Falcon 9, so I got to consult with all of them. I also worked the OG-2 missions on Falcon 9. So oh, cool. I worked several Falcon 9s in a row from 2012 to 2014. 
and that just reinvigorated me with the new space mentality. Um, then I worked with Google for two years on, on Skybox, so got more new space, you know, Skybox, flavor. That, that wasn't the, the balloon thing. No, no, it? no, that no. was a different Google program. So Skybox was a small startup in Silicon Valley. Google bought them. Um, now Planet owns, owns them, actually. So Google owned them for a couple years, and I was uh, delivering the propulsion modules to, to them. So okay, green, cool. green propellant out of Sweden. But anyways, that I, w I got the new space bug, and I was really like looking at all the good things that we've learned in the you know 50 years of doing this stuff, and then all the new stuff that we're now learning with you know kind of reinventing it, the the passion, the vision, the empowerment that the new space gives you versus yeah. the heritage, you know, good test rigor, good documentation, but each side also had a bunch of flaws too. So. When I came to Firefly, I started consulting. One of the first things I said was like, this is a clean slate. We can take the best of both worlds and bring it into the, make the ultimate aerospace company. So that's, that's really awesome. been our focus, is to really empower people with clear vision, passionate workforce, to do awesome stuff like, like this, like land on the moon. So that's what Firefly is about. And that's, that's kind of my role here. Wow. So, and that's something that a lot of people don't think realize is, is one of your upcoming missions, one of your upcoming programs is Blue Ghost which will be landing on the moon. So tell us, I actually don't know a ton about Blue Ghost, so tell me, give me like the overview of, uh, of uh, what it's doing, what its purpose is, and why it's a unique technology. So Blue Ghost is our lunar lander, and it can deliver up to about 150 kilograms of payload, which are mostly science experiments. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, just like on Alpha, we're highly vertically integrated. We build our own, our, our own thrusters, our own structures, our own avionics, and then we buy some of the key components like star trackers and, um, you know, IMUs and other other devices like that. Yeah. So we are um, we're actually launching on a Falcon 9, uh, just because it's too big to land launch right. on, a, on an Alpha, and that's yeah, getting in to the uh, moon with a, a vehicle that size takes a, yeah, a big yeah. Yeah. You need to, to get that. to T you need to get a TLI injection, so Falcon 9 can do that for us. Yep. And um, they've been you know SpaceX has been great. Uh, we were we're launching in about 18 months. Wow. For that mission. So what? Uh, other than other science instruments on it, what instruments are built into, like are there a bunch of cameras and stuff that you're gonna be able yeah, to look at? Yeah, so we're loaded, we have stuff? 11 cameras. They're wow. pretty much full full panoramic views. We're actually gonna do high def video all the way, the whole transit, so that we can you know, maybe do something with that, make it into a, a oh, documentary. Wow. You know, Things that have just have never been done before with that wow. video. We also have some of the experiments we're getting are really unique where we're actually testing the GPS constellation, for example, once we get outside of the GPS realm. So if we could use, figure out a way to use GPS all the way to the moon, that's not what it was intended for. Right. But basically, if you imagine the spacecraft that are on the backside of the Earth and you're over here, you can still talk to them. So one of the payloads is to look at that. Most of the payloads are lunar-centric, so when we get to the moon, they're either drilling into the, into the lunar surface or they're collecting regolith, they're analyzing the regolith, or they're looking back at Earth. Um, and uh, in, anything from like retro reflectors to uh, basically a large telescope that's on top of the lander. Wow. So, so there's already, just on your, on the vehicles then, there's already just a handful of stuff that it's capable of doing. Yeah, well, sorry. So yeah, some of that, uh, some of that is the NASA payload. So okay. yeah, so to your question, um, really all we can do is, it's, it's almost like a, a rocket itself, right? It's yeah. mostly pr propulsive, uh, it's mostly propellant. And then we have, we're full of cameras and we have our own navigation suite. Yep. Everything to get us to the moon, to navigate, proper landing, do hazard avoidance, strafe as needed, properly wow. land. And then we pretty much every kilogram we have left over is turned over to payloads. Payload, okay. And then they, they do their thing. So you guys have to do, you have to first do the, because uh, you're just on a TLI. So it first has to get into lunar orbital insertion yep. burn. And then lower down and, and navigate all of that, handle all, so all of that is stuff that you guys had to design and, and, and build out. Yeah. So I guess what, what well, I assume it's obviously right. a bipropellant. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a it's a um, hypergolic bipropellant. It's 1,500 kilograms is our total launch mass. Over 800 of that is just propellant. Yep. Uh, our main engine is a 1,300 newton main engine, and it's all pressure fed. You know, no turbo machinery, yep. anything like that. And then we have eight RCS, which are 200 Newton RCS thrusters for steering. And then we have some cold gas for some fine tuning of Additional, steering. Okay. And these uh, are engines that you guys designed and built in house too? Uh, the main engine we buy from a key supplier, um, uh, which is NAMO out of UK. And then our, but our RCS is we're designing it and building it in house. Wow. It, it's fun that I didn't realize that you had worked so much uh, on, on Antares already and, and had that experience. And now, in your new position, you're working with Antares again because you guys right. are going to be 
uh, pro you know, providing the, the booster. So tell me what you can about that, because that's a pretty fresh development. So it's, to me, it's great because friends of mine that I worked with in the early days, um, some, of the, some of the original Antares people are still there. Um, this, is, this is kind of the next, next growth for, for Firefly to capture this, this medium class market. It's still a ways from the, the SpaceX market, um, but it's capturing spacecraft that are too big for Alpha, but really kind of too small for, for a Falcon. So we think there's this intermediate market that, that Delta II has still, we've been talking about the Delta II market that's been a void for you know, almost 20 years now. I mean, it's, it hasn't been 20 years, right, but right. 20 years ago, Delta II was going to be retired, you know, in a year now. And then it, <laughs> it, it went kept, long, yeah. it kept going and going, oh, we got, we got some more parts over here. Yeah. You know, it really builds off the, the alpha technology in terms of full composite structure, uh, it, tap off cycle, it is engines, tap -off things cycle. like that. It's super so. exciting. It's, I mean, it's so exciting to see where you guys are today already. And I, I just cannot wait to see this thing fly. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be a good time. It really will be. Thank you so much for okay. your time and, Thank you. and best of luck on Sunday. Great talking to you. Thank you. Introduce yourself. Uh, what do you do here at Firefly? Yeah. Hi, my name is Jordi Paredes and I'm the chief engineer for the Alpha launch vehicle. Awesome. So you, uh, I've, again, I'm talking to all these people that like, you guys know this thing inside and out, don't you? Uh, yeah. I spent now like over two and a half years uh, working on this vehicle uh, from the beginning to now. Uh, so I was the chief engineer also for Flight One and then all the development that we had on there. So yeah, I spent a lot of time working on this one. Wow, so give me just a quick rundown. What has changed between Flight 1 and Flight 2 for you? And what are you looking forward to on, on this launch attempt? What has changed, uh, mostly processes. Uh, you know, like we got to Flight 1 uh, really quickly, getting to orbit as, as fast as we could. Uh, and then uh, we were developing a lot of processes in the company on like how to handle risk, how to handle no conformances. So one thing that we did for uh, flight two is that we made sure that this was a completely a flight vehicle, not kind of a qualification right. like our first vehicle was. Yeah. So the first one, we beat the hell out of it on testing on the test and trying to nail down timing, trying to nail down the, you know, the proper loading, the operations. So that was kind of our learning vehicle mm -hmm. that we considered our proto qualification vehicle. Um, so that's why it was pretty beaten. It was almost to its limit of life. Right. Um, so this one, instead, it has followed kind of a nominal uh, flight expected vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it's still a flight test because, uh, again, we haven't get to orbit, so there's a lot to learn. But mostly it's been that. Uh, uh, it's making it more a flight vehicle right now. That's amazing. And I've, my, yeah, my understanding is that every, uh, Megan was saying that everything's basically been hit like right away. It's just kind of first fuel up attempts, just things are just running very smoothly on yeah, this vehicle. Yeah. So I, I got to say, for example, flight one, it took us 18 times, 18 attempts to light it the first time at, uh, at bricks, mm -hmm. just testing, developing the timing. Like, you know, it's four engines. We had done it yeah. at component level at engine, but when you put it all together yeah. and actually you go from horizontal to vertical, many things change. Yes. So like it took us some time to learn the timing, to mess up. We had fires, like it was a mess, you know, <laughs> yeah. like that, that's how rockets work that's when you start. It, yeah. So, but the beauty is that actually after the 18th time, once we nailed our first ignition at bricks, we came here and we went for launch. And the first day when we went, it went. Um, one one thing, I was, a little question I had. How did you? What did you end up doing to change the connector? Because I know the E2 yeah. engine. No, that was a really actually an easy an easy fix. Because uh, the connectors are really good. We had a really uh, space grade quality connector. We just put it on the wrong spot. You know, it wasn't a spot that there was like high vibration environments. You know, and that oh. we had seen it uh, uh, fail in the past. The problem is again, we were rushing and we thought, okay, that's the issue. We fixed it and we continued going, and then it felt again, and we thought, oh, that we fixed it. You know, it's good. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that that location specifically, and with that engine that was a little more poppy, more, yep. more jumping than others, uh, it ended up failing. Yes. So for me, even in the middle of the investigation, I just took a shotgun approach and I said, out of here. We looked at what's the safest spot you can put it on the engine bay. So we looked at it and it's like, okay, thrust structure is the one that's the most stiff, that vibrates the less. Just kill the problem, bring it up here. So we beefed it up. It's a little a shotgun approach because it's right. a little heavier. We could optimize it, but like it killed our first mission. We said, never again. Yeah. So we took it up there. We uh, uh, installed it. Uh, even while the investigation was going, we knew that that had to fix. So we fixed it. Uh, we feel really good about it. And then during stage testing, we put accelerometers and verified that the levels that that connector saw were like an order of magnitude lower than we had before. Wow. So we were way below the qualification levels. So we feel really good about it. I, I think you guys are going to nail it. Honestly, it just, it feels really good. We hope, we hope. We did everything we could. Uh, we worked really hard. We added, I mean, this, this vehicle has 8% higher thrust. Um, oh. So we, we did a lot of work on that. Really? Yeah, and our upcoming vehicle even has like higher thrust. Our uh, engine performance has increased a lot. Really? Like we are, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're really happy. Our stage two performance has also improved. You can tell when you have development engines versus you go into more kind of a production and we start nailing it and saying like, okay, we're good with performance. We're happy. Repeat it. 
And yeah. like, you know, it's like the turbo pumps. They are like, it's an art. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a machinery that we go to the thousands of an inch. Right. So like we have guys now that they look at s s specific things that the more engines we build, the more engines we test, the better we feel. It's like these four engines that we tested, they were like spot on wow. in performance and efficiency. Flight three engines, they were also, I think we're just spending the last one to test. But they were all tested, the performance has increased, we exceed the levels, so it's, it's, it's much better. And what are you doing to increase the performance? Are you kind of just running them a little bit uh, less fuel rich, or how are you getting the extra so performance? So that's the beauty. Uh, so, stage two, we kept the 2.3 OF uh, mm -hmm. oxygen fuel ratio that we had. Uh, stage one, uh, we had a 2.2. Yep. And for flight three, we're going to increase it to 2.3. Because again, like we started conservative on flight yeah. one. You see, like we're targeting like 45,000 pounds of force for our engines. That was our POC uh, target performance. Yep. But to be cautious, we started with 39,000 first. Okay. You know, and then we we're going to go like 42 and yep. then 45. Just we wanted to, you know, like just be, be gentle with the engines. And mm -hmm. honestly, these engines with the top off cycle, it's, it's pretty neat because at the end, it's just, it's kind of a, a with the gas that we feed the turbine from the, uh, uh, from the chamber, we just uh, orifice it, you know, yeah. so we control how much we give. So, so it, kind of has a, it can't run away from itself almost. It cause... cannot, it cannot. Yeah. Again, it has its limitations, you know, so in the long run, if we want to do more fancy missions, more throttling maneuvers, that it gets a little more tricky. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of it, of the top of it, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. We set it, we tune it, and we say, that's the power I want. Yep. You want more power? Give it a little bit more gas. You want less power? You give it a little bit less. So what's the, the new Miranda engine that's going to be on, on, on Antares and on your Beta? Uh -huh. uh, Tell me what you can about it. How 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 big are we talking? Because I know tap off kind of has a like you said, it has a little bit of a, a limitation. How uh -huh. how far are you going with that? Well, tap I mean, you know the thrust levels, and again, that's kind of a little bit out of my expertise. I'm trying to stay on on, on alpha mm -hmm. for it, but yeah, you're talking of two hundred thousand pounds. You yeah. know, so it's much larger than what we have right now. Yeah. So to me, the key, the magic of it is the the pump itself. You mm -hmm. know, making it grow. Not everything scales that easy. Right. So that's taking some time to learn and work it to get that pump going. Uh, and then also the manufacturing processes change a lot. You know, making, mm -hmm. you know, that we are uh, film cooled, uh, we're gonna do the same thing for this. So getting that, uh, that um, scaling, it takes some time and that's what we're working right now. Well, good luck. We're all so excited to see yeah, this thing. thank fly. you. Thank you so much to the teams at Firefly for providing us with this kind of access. It's just been amazing. I've been nerding out having the time of my life out here. So I hope you guys are tuning in because we are the official live stream providers for this launch attempt to, to the black. So tune in because we're gonna be doing it in 4K. We have cameras up the wazoo and it's going to be absolutely amazing. So hopefully you guys tune in and catch it. You will not want to miss this. I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make this and everything we do here at Everyday Astronaut possible. If you guys want to help me continue to do what I do and get some access to some exclusive things, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out our awesome web store for things like this, the incredible space shuttle inspired hoodie from the first four missions of the space shuttle. This is one of my favorite things in our store. Check it out along with a lot of other cool stuff, such as our dress wear or our schematics collection or our future Martian collection. Lots of really fun, cool stuff for you and anyone that loves space flight things. Check it out at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.